Well, thank you, Mike. Good evening and, and uh, welcome to this edition of the Civil War Roundtable Congress. Uh, again, I'm Michael Block and I wanna to speak tonight. I'm gonna to be speaking to you tonight on the Battle of Cedar Mountain. Believe it or not, I was not there at the Battle of Cedar Mountain. And so I am relying on what previous historians, uh, participants and records tell us what was, what, what happened at this battle. And so I always had this as my disclaimer to start off with the two pre the uh, the two protagonists in this fight, John Pope on the left, and I like this image of John uh, because it's of in his I like to say his Egyptian stage with that pharaoh beard going there, and of course Stonewall Jackson on the right. Pope is in command of the army of the of the army of Virginia, and Stonewall Jackson is not part of the army of Northern Virginia, but he is still uh, the commander of the army of the Valley. And as a matter of fact, this will be his last action as a commander of the Army of the Valley. Um, after, afterwards, he will be attached to Robert E. Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia for the remainder of, of his life. Uh, what I want to give you right now is a couple uh, images of the uh, key commanders that are going to be taking part in the Battle of Cedar Mountain, just so we have an understanding of who some of these guys are. This is Nathaniel Banks's second corps of the Army of Virginia. It's the only corps that participated in the fight. Uh, I like this image because it kind of gives you uh, maybe another look at the 1862 facial hair uh, contestants from the Army of, Nor uh, Army of Virginia. All, you know, all of them have some, some kind of unique stuff there. Augur and Geary are going to be wounded during this fight, and Henry Prince is going to become a prisoner. So the, uh, leadership, the leadership of the Army of Virginia is going to be impacted by what happens on this day. On the Confederate side, Stonewall Jackson is going to bring with him three divisions, the first under Charles Winder, uh, and he's got three brigades under him. Uh, Thomas Garnett, cousin of Richard, who is more famous. Uh, Charles Ronald is leading the Stonewall Brigade, and we don't have any pictures of him, and he is the only action uh, that Ronald is going to be leading this brigade. Afterwards, he, he is gone from, from the Army, and of course, uh, William Tolliver. Richard Yule's got three brigades with him, Charles Forno, Jubal Early, and Isaac Tremble. And Yule's, Yule's command is going to be the first one on the field. A.P. Hill is part of Stonewall Jackson's command uh, for this fight and for the remainder. He brings seven brigades with him. Six are shown here, the seventh under, under Macy Gregg is uh, guarding, guarding a fort at uh, guarding Barnett's Ford. Lawrence O'Brien Branch. On the, on the right side of the screen there. He's gonna play probably the key role in this battle. And he's the one that's really gonna save the day. I, I show these brigade commanders because this fight is fought by the brigades. The division commanders had very little role after bringing the men on the field. Banks and Jackson have very little role in, in leading the action. Uh, they they are more react. They're both reacting to events more than more than actual participating and making command decisions during during the course of the August 9th fight. This is the situation in mid July 1862. John Pope is the new commander of the Army of Virginia, and he is in Washington D.C. He has with him the the corps of Nathaniel Banks, Franz Siegel, and Erwin McDowell. Erwin McDowell's name's not on here because his two divisions under Ricketts and King are scattered about. Ricketts is outside of Warrenton at a place called Waterloo, uh, and King is down in, in Fredericksburg guarding, guarding that portion of the line. The two cavalry brigades under George uh, Bayard and James Hatch, I can't remember Hatch's first name right now, uh, are scouting and maneuvering uh, throughout Orange, Green, Spotsylvania, and Madison counties, feeling out for the enemy. Robert E. Lee has bottled George McClellan up on the Virginia Peninsula down in the vicinity of Harrison's Landing. Jackson uh, is detached on July 13th to Louisa Courthouse. Lee is concerned that Pope with his gathering army in, in the northern part of Virginia, approximately 42,000 men are gonna make a threat towards the 
key rail junction at Gordonsville, which is right here practically in the center of the map. But he is, he is concerned about another person and believe it or not, what's keeping Robert E. Lee awake at night in, in early and mid-July is Ambrose Burnside. Burnside with his division and another under Isaac Stevens have left North and South Carolina respectively and are heading North. Lee has no idea where they are going to, to disembark. If they disembark with McClellan and Harrison's landing, uh, McClellan might have the option to renew the offensive there. If they continue up, up the James to perhaps uh, City Point or the Bermuda 100, Richmond will be threatened from the south and Lee's gonna have to spread his forces uh, on the south side of the James to protect, to protect Richmond. And on also, if he continues north to the Fredericksburg area, uh, disembarking at Aquia Landing, uh, the threat's gonna be from the north. So until Lee knows where Burnside's going, Jackson's kind of on a short leash. Now, why is Jackson and Louisa? Well, it's all because of the railroad at Gordonsville. We'll start down at the bottom with Jackson. Jackson has been sent to Louisa Courthouse uh, to protect the, the key junction at Gordonsville. Any rail traffic coming into Richmond from the west is going through Gordonsville. That means the food from the Shenandoah Valley and from, and from the Tennessee Valley. If Jackson, continue, if Jackson can hold Gordonsville, Pope is gonna be denied access uh, to that rail line. What Pope wants to do is push down from Culpeper Courthouse, take Gordonsville, threaten Charlottesville and the Western entrance, the entrance to uh, Richmond. By doing so, he's gonna force Lee to again divide his army and allow at this point of, of the of the campaign allow McClellan to to dis to to embark at Harrison's Landing and and move farther north uh, to to the to uh, Alexandria or Aquia. This is the plan that that Henry Halleck and and Abraham Lincoln have agreed upon. The original plan was for Pope to move south and threaten Gordonsville and move to the west of Richmond. Uh, to force Lee to divide up and fight two fronts. But with McClellan's defeat at the Seven Days Campaign, their, their plans have changed. In addition to maneuvering south to allow McClellan a way out, Pope's plans, Pope's orders are, of course, to defend Washington, just like any, any army in Northern, any army of the Potomac or army in Virginia's commander, is to, is to protect Washington. He also has to secure that line of communications from a quiet landing all the way to call through Culpeper Count uh, Courthouse and on to the on, on to the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, to keep that line of communication off because his open because his armies are spread all the way across. Matter of fact, he's got he still has resources in the Shenandoah Valley, and that's why King is still there. As the month progresses, Jackson gets additional opportunity to strike an offensive blow against Pope if the if the opportunity presents itself. In the middle of the month, during the course of the middle of the month, a series of orders comes from Pope's headquarters. Three key ones basically say, we're gonna live off the land. If something happens, a second one's going to be, if something happens, if there's a raid, a guerrilla raid or an attack on our lines of communication or forces, civilians are gonna be turned out to repair the damage as well as pay for the damage. And finally, every male citizen is gonna to have to take the oath of allegiance. If they choose not to take that oath of allegiance, they're gonna be sent south beyond the lines of the federal army. But it's also noted that if the federals advance or that person becomes in contact with the federals again, he's gonna be considered a spy and summarily executed. So Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee don't like the way this war has changed. Uh, this is where Lee, quotes uh, is quoted as calling Pope a miscreant. So he wants Pope suppressed. If Jackson has that opportunity, he's, going, he's, he's allowed to, as I like to say, punch Pope in the nose. Pope does not, uh, Jackson doesn't have the offensive punch until later in the month when A.P. Hill is detached from uh, Lee's command and is, sent to, and is sent to Louisa and eventually Gordonsville, uh, which will bring Jackson's 
horses up to 22,000. Again, still, still less than uh, Pope's 42,000 that he's gonna have uh, available to him. This is a situation by, by late July as, as things start to move. By early August, Crawford, Samuel Crawford and his brigade has moved into, into the Culpeper area supporting George Bayard and now John Buford's brigade of cavalry. Hatches had two unsuccessful raids into Orange Courthouse and in Green County, the second time he was chased over the mountains and up to Shenandoah, back to Little Washington at the top of the map there. Two times he was gone, so Pope relieves, relieves Hatch and brings in John Buford out of uh, an administrative position in the Washington, D.C. area. Probably the best military decision John Pope had in the way of personnel during the course of the war. And John, John Buford, of course, is a well-known well -known entity. Pope is going to leave Washington on July 29th. Lincoln had kept him there until that time because he, he, was, a trust, he was a trusted advisor to Lincoln. He was a Republican. He was known to Lincoln. As a matter of fact, he came east on the Lincoln's inaugural train. He was a known quantity. He was not a Democrat like George McClellan. And why he kept him in Washington was to look at the messages that McClellan was sending Lincoln and the War Department to kind of help Lincoln understand exactly what was going on from a military perspective. So on the 29th, Pope is going to leave Washington, head to Warrenton and eventually Waterloo Bridge and join and then continue west to join Banks at, at Washington, uh, today called Little Washington. On the 6th of August, uh, Pope orders his, his, his army to move south. Ricketts will pass down what's now today uh, the Rick Steville Turnpike to Culpeper Courthouse. Banks will leave Washington, pass through Sperryville and come down modern 522, the Sperryville Turnpike uh, approaching Culpeper and Siegel is to follow. Jackson gets wind of this movement and decides the time is ripe to strike Pope if, if the opportunity presents itself. So on the evening of August 7th, Jackson's going to send orders out to his three division commanders basically saying Ewell is going to march from Liberty Mills east into Orange Courthouse, hang, hang a left there at the courthouse and move up to Barnett's Ford. AP Hill's division, which has moved up from Gordonsville, will follow and Charles Winder commanding Stonewall Jackson's old division will trail the column. After these orders are sent, Jackson realizes that it's an easier path for Ewell if he moves forward from Liberty Mills and goes up another path along the along the Rapidan River to Barnett's Ford, bypassing Orange altogether, and he orders, the, he orders Ewell's division to do so. He, of course, neglects to tell A.P. Hill and Charles Winder of this change in, in, the, in the movement. On the morning of August 8th, A.P. Hill has his men lined up, ready to march with Stonewall Jackson's army for the first time, and he sees a column passing. He's new to the army, so he doesn't recognize who it is at first, but after a brigade passes, he soon realizes that it's Charles Winder's division and not A.P. Hill's. It's at this time that Jackson rides up. Uh, some very curt words are spoken by both men and the relationship with Jackson and Hill, which was never good to begin with. They, they had a, a falling out back at West Point, uh, deteriorates to the point where these two will never speak to each other except through a professional means. Uh, during the course of their duties. Hill, Hill decides that his best move is to let Winder's entire column to include its uh, wagon trains pass before he leaves his, his encampment just south of Orange Courthouse. As you can see throughout the day on August 8th as, the, as Jackson's armies advanced, he had a, they were fighting a series of skirmishes along, along the Culpeper Courthouse or in Courthouse Road slowing the column down considerably. The heat was also a factor. The temperature during this movement was in the mid 90s as it would, had been for three or four days prior and would continue to be in the mid 90s until after the battle actually took place on August 9th. Ewell's command reached Barnett's Fort first as, as was anticipated. However, his, his army, his division moving through and the wagon trains following created such a traffic jam at the Ford that only um, he, his division passed through without 
relative incident and got as far as Crooked Run Baptist Church, uh, about six miles from the eventual battlefield. Winder's division finally crossed Barnett's Ford late in the afternoon and progressed only about a mile past the Ford. And A.P. Hill, who was originally, of course, second in line, got to the Ford, saw the traffic jam and the, and the uh, of movement that was there, actually turned his division around and went back to Orange and camped about a mile north of town. Jackson is going to declare this night that is the worst day of marching in his army. He's, he basically tells Robert E. Lee, I am not making much process, progress, excuse me. And I fear, I fear that my actions on this day will not lead to a, a beneficial conclusion to any events. Turns out that the actions from the Federal Cavalry forced Jackson to detach one of his brigades at Barnett's Fort Dow of Massey Gregg's and a second brigade under Alexander Lawton at Crooked Run Baptist Church. And that is to protect, because of all the cavalry actions, that was to protect the, the uh, line of communication and Jackson's wagons. Uh, Jackson's gonna have approximately 1200 wagons at Crooked Run Baptist Church, uh, protected by Lawton. Lawton was chosen because he was senior to Charles Winder and Jackson wanted Winder in charge of his division on this day. So the stage is set by the morning of August 9th, Jackson's lead elements are about six miles from the battlefield. Samuel Crawford has moved down from Culpeper to just north of the battlefield to provide support for Bayard and Buford's horse soldiers. Banks has moved just north of Culpeper Courthouse and Siegel remained in, in Sperryville. As a matter of fact, Franz Siegel sent a note to Pope on the afternoon of, of August of August 8th, asking him which road should he take to head south to Culpeper Courthouse. As you can see on the modern, on the map from 1862, as well as that is similar to the, today's map, there's only one road between Sperryville and Culpeper Courthouse, and Pope was beside himself uh, answering this response to, to Siegel. By the morning of August 9th, Bayard's Brigade of, of Cavalry had aligned itself along what is now known as the Crittenden Farm Lane, the first Pennsylvania cab in the woods and along the, on the Culpeper Courthouse, Orange Court, Courthouse Road, the first New Jersey out in the fields uh, in the middle and the first Rhode Island along the base, the spreading out from the base of the mountain toward linking up with the first New Jersey. The first infantry from Jackson's command to advance on the morning of August 9th was Jubilee Early's brigade. They marched up uh, to within sight of the battlefield. And by early afternoon, it was decided that it was time to clear out the Federal Cavalry. And he swept around the woods and he began to engage as well as some artillery from a ridge near the schoolhouse began to uh, engage with the, with the Federal Cavalry along, along the Crittenden farm lane. Federal artillery had shown up and they were positioned along Mitchell Station Road and would respond as, as, the, as the Confederates advanced. It's interesting that uh, the historian from the first New Jersey, the chaplain Pine, talks, talks about uh, the soldiers of the first New Jersey as this action got underway. The same indifferent talking, eating and drinking was, was going on that characterizes an ordinary halt. Indeed, at the very moment when a shell was whistling above our, our heads, the discovery of a rabbit scuttling through the corn created an excitement which drew the attention of the men entirely away from the destructive missile. They're still boys and, and boys are gonna be boys. They're gonna chase a rabbit while shells are flying overhead. I mentioned earlier, it was hot on this day. Frederick Dennison, the chaplain for the first Rhode Island is gonna write that he refills his canteen and passes it out to the soldiers on the skirmish line. He, ref he refills that canteen 17 times. Early's men are going to move forward and clear out the clear out the federal cavalry. They're going to withdraw back off of the field for the most part, uh, guarding the flanks. And Early, followed by the remainder of, of Jackson's army, is going to proceed up the Culpeper Orange Courthouse Road. Early uh, Ewell's other two brigades under Isaac Trimmel and Charles Forno are going to move along uh, a second farm lane and approach the slope of Cedar Mountain, move along a road there, 
and, and, and attached and, and put themselves in a position high above the battlefield, along with, along with Forno and Trimble is Lieutenant Joseph Latimer, 18 years old on this day in August, 1862. He left VMI in his second year and he's been a newly promoted captain and he's the chief of Buell's artillery. Latimer is gonna move with his gunners, is gonna move ahead of the, his artillery, establishing his position on the shelf of Cedar Mountain and that's in this area right here where he was in this open spot. And while his artillery, his guns are being moved up and along the mountain, he and his gunners are gonna cut the fuses that they brought with them. So once they get, when the guns get here, they're gonna be able to start engaging right away. This is probably the uh, best round that any Confederate artillery regiment or batteries, sorry, is gonna have during the course of the war. Uh, it's about 150 to 200 feet above the plain of Cedar Mountain where the majority of the battle is fought. And he's gonna be, and Latimer and his gunners are gonna be protected by two brigades of infantry. Nobody is gonna to touch this, touch these guns throughout the fight. The artillery duel is gonna take place probably beginning around 3.30 in the afternoon and run for about 90 minutes. The position of Latimer's guns is on the extreme left flank of the federal position. And along with the guns at the base of the mountain and over near the Crittenden Lane, it's gonna set up a converging fire at any point on the, on the battlefield that the Confederates choose to fire upon. The Federals on the other hand have to, have to pick, pick and choose their targets if they wanna go after the artillery up on, up, on, up on the mountain or down in the valley below. It's during this time that two of the most significant casualties for the Confederates is gonna, is gonna take place. The first is the division commander, Charles Winder. Winder is at the Crittenden farm lane, directing traffic as his brigades approach the field, as well as trying to help and direct artillery fire from the, from the four guns that were placed at the, at the gate. Uh, he's an artillerist at heart, and there's times in conflict where you kind of, you reduce yourself to the, your lowest common denominator, and that is a battery commander. So between directing guns and trying to direct traffic, uh, he is he is he's a little distracted. And at some point during this fight, he's going to lean over and try to give directions to one of the artillery crews, and a shell is going to cut through uh, his his chest on the left side, and he's going to be mortally wounded, surviving for about an hour before he passes. He's going to be the only Confederate general killed in Culpeper during the course of the war. His senior brigadier, Tolliver, uh, is informed of Winder's mortal wounding. But like Jackson, Winder does not disseminate his orders or give direction other than you need to go in this direction or, or attack this hill. So Winder has to spend some time trying to figure out exactly what is going on with his, his, with his division now. And he is, and he is, uh, he's a little scattered and distracted as he rides out to uh, get his his brigades in line. The second, the second significant injury is to R. Snowden Andrews, who is Winder's chief of artillery. Uh, as the federal fire was converging on the Crittenden farm lane, it was determined that these guns need to be repositioned, scattered away a little bit, and. Two of those guns are moved forward, actually to pretty near where our replica guns on the Cedar Mountain battlefield today were placed. And as he was moving those into position, uh, he, is, he, is, he is cut by a piece of shrapnel that opens up his, his stomach and intestines. Uh, and he is basically gonna fall from his horse, fortunately holding his, his intestines in as he falls. Uh, two doctors are gonna basically say that he is, uh, dead and as 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 winder as andrews uh as andrews was quoted as saying that if you damn doctors would do something i'd get well i once had a hound dog that ran for a mile with its guts out and caught a fox and i know that i'm as good as any damn dog that ever lived as, as, as much as i can stand so the line the line allegedly said by the doctors was he's got as much grit in him as he does on him 
Andrews is going to be evacuated six miles to a home called Spring Hill. It still stands today, uh, where he will recover after the battle. His wife is going to come down uh, through the lines with their youngest child, still, still an infant. Uh, she is given an ambulance to pass through the lines and has medicines in it, uh, given to her by Lewis Marshall, Robert E. Lee's nephew. So he will survive. He will be wounded again seriously at Stevens Depot during the uh, Gettysburg campaign. So by five o'clock, everybody's in place pretty much for action. Banks had orders that day from John Pope not to bring on an engagement. His orders basically said to find yourself a defensive position, advance your skirmishers, and do not engage the enemy, even if the skirmishers, uh, enemy skirmishers come forward. Pope wanted to wait for the entire Army of Virginia to come up. Banks has with him on this day approximately 9,000 men. And, I re and, and Stonewall Jackson has, uh, will bring 22,000 men to the field. So we know how this battle is going to turn out if, if, when Banks engages. Henry Palouse, who's on Banks' staff, receives those verbal orders. And that's, that was the problem. They were verbal orders. Palouse interprets these orders are to advance to a defensive position, move your skirmishers forward, and if engaged, engage the enemy. As Banks approaches the field with the rest of his, with his corps, he sees Jackson's men strung out in various locations, up on Cedar Mountain, down in the valley, and on the far, far eastern and western sides of, of, this, of this valley area. And he believes he has an opportunity to strike. Banks, of course, has the nickname of Commissary Banks and is looking to redeem himself against Jackson and the army of the valley that has defeated him earlier in the year. So he decides to move his brigades forward and strike Jackson's men, looking for an opportunity to break Jackson and push him back down the Orange Courthouse Road uh, where he came. So the battle is going to gener degenerate into a series of brigade actions, uh, beginning with Augur's division and spreading towards, uh, towards, towards Alphilius Williams' men. First, the first attack begins shortly after five o'clock with the brigade of John Gary's men advancing, advancing along the Orange Courthouse, Culpeper Courthouse Road. Gary's got four regiments of Ohio infantry, and his goal is to push, push down the road, through some corn, and engage the infantry under Tolliver that they see along uh, the Crittenden farm lane. They were supposed to move out with Henry Prince and his brigade, but Gary started out a little early. In front of all these, in front of, in front of these two brigades is the 8th and 12th U.S. Infantry Battalion, and on this day, they are acting as skirmishers for Christopher Auger. Geary, as he advances down the, the road, comes in contact with Garnett's brigade, which is along an area known as the Point, and they'd occupied this position in an L-shaped uh, defensive position in trees. And so they were not seen until Geary's men became almost uh, alongside them on their flank, and Garnett's men opened fire on Geary at this point, pushing them out into the corn. Prince's men advanced as well through this open field here with the 111th and 3rd Maryland out in front in trailing by the 109th Pennsylvania and the 102nd New York. Before the 109th and 102nd stepped off, they were reminded that there was infantry to their front and to their right. As they advanced and started to engage, the second volley of the 109th Pennsylvania went to the back of the 3rd Maryland, who immediately, fearing that they were being flanked or attacked in their rear, broke and fell back. The 111th Pennsylvania, seeing this, also broke and retreated. The other two regiments saw their compatriots retreating, and they also retreated. Fortunately for Prince and this brigade, the retreat was brief, as during the, before the advance, Prince had found a spot to rally the troops in case something happened, and everyone formed on this rally and moved forward again. They would continue to move forward with their skirmishers out in front, the skirmishers actually engaging with the artillery, the Confederate artillery in the area of the Cedars, and would push back 
uh, Jubal Early's men uh, off this ridge that you see on this image here. Uh, Walker would Walker, who was in command of the 13th Virginia on the far left of, of Early's brigade, would write in his after action report, we continued to hold our position for a few minutes, holding the enemy in our front and check when finding the enemy had advanced under the cover of woods on our left. We were, poured, we were pouring fire into my left flank. I ordered my regiment to fall back. We had no sooner given up this position than the enemy following planted a federal and a Maryland flag on ours, on where ours stood a moment before, it opened fire on us at very close range. We continued to fall back for about 200 yards. Early's men were pushed off this position, and it was about the same time that Crawford's men had attacked, and that would be about 30 minutes after Prince had originally stepped off. Again, they advanced through corn on both sides, and matter of fact, the Ohio Brigade would use the corn as, as cover. They would step out of the corn, fire rounds at either Garnett's men to their right or Tolliver in their front and fall back into the corn. And you can see uh, from the box down there the kind of casualties they took during this action here. Geary was wounded during this fight, as were a couple of their regimental commanders, and it broke down to the point where communication between the company commanders had broken down also. Lieutenant Mervyn Clark mistook an order uh, to retreat for an order to charge and with a dozen men dashed at a double line, dashed at a double line of infantry uh, before having been forced to recall, being recalled. There was one man in one of the Ohio regiments, the 66th Ohio, I believe, George Lantham. Lantham uh, was seen walking off the field and at first uh, they thought he was just uh, shirking his duty. But when he came across the correspondent that's responding, uh, reporting this, George Townsend, you could see that Lantham had been wounded in his fingers. Those fingers were bandaged up and he turned to go back to the fight. He stopped, handed his weapon to Townsend and another soldier there and asked him to load it for him because he still wanted to get another shot at the enemy. Lantham uh, would be one of the few, would, would die after this battle uh, from that injury and is one of the few identified soldiers in the Culpeper National Cemetery from the Battle of Cedar Mountain. About between 15 and 25 minutes after Augur's division attacked, Samuel Crawford got the order to go forward. He had been, in, he had been on a ridge in the trees and had been waiting for orders to, orders to move forward. And again, it would be a disjointed attack. Crawford has four regiments with him this day, the 46th Pennsylvania, 28th New York, and 5th Connecticut. His fourth regiment, the 10th Maine, is being withheld by Banks as a strategic reserve. Crawford's going to advance down this slope and into an open wheat field and, and, and advance up a rise towards Garnett's men. When Tolliver assumed command of the division, he realized that Garnett was kind of hung out here all by himself. Again, about 475 yards between Garnett's right and Tolliver's left. Gar Tolliver's gonna detach the, the 10th Virginia from his brigade and have it advance and link up with the 1st Virginia Battalion. And he's gonna reach out to his third brigade under Charles Ronald, the Stonewall Brigade, and have them link up uh, as well, forming a continuous line. Neither the Stonewall Brigade or the 10th Virginia are gonna reach Garnett in time, and it's gonna have dire consequences for Garnett's men. The 5th Connecticut is gonna launch themselves right up against this wall of Confederates uh, and suffer se severe casualties. The 28th New York uh, advanced along at the edge of the, uh, the 1st Virginia Battalion's line, and they're gonna peel around their flank. As a matter of fact, the 1st Virginia is going to report in their after action report that they fired three rounds at the advancing Federals, all three going over their heads. The fourth time they fired, the Federals were upon them. The 28th New York is going to sweep around the 1st Virginia's flank, which is in the woods, and actually strike behind the 21st Virginia. The first, the first indication the 21st Virginia 
is in trouble is when they start taking fire from their into their backs and start being bayoneted in their backs. Uh, their commander, by the name of Cunningham, is going to be shot trying to lead his men out of this trap. One of one of the uh, one of the Confederates is going to write that we were mixed up like chickens and ducks. That's how bad this fighting would take place. There's atrocities that are being committed in these woods here. One of the uh, one of Garnett's after action reports from the 48th Virginia is going to report that uh, when they retreated, a lieutenant was seen wounded on the ground. And when they returned and recovered this area late in the fight, he was he was mortally wounded with multiple stab wounds. Uh, the Federals just took took it out on this poor lieutenant. The 46th, the 46th Pennsylvania on the extreme right of Crawford's line is going to sweep in unopposed uh, around Garnett's position. And as they advance up a draw, they're going to strike the 10th Virginia, who was just moving into position. And are, they are thrown back in turn, th thrown back into the 27th Virginia. And both of those regiments are going to be basically knocked out of the fight before they have a chance to be in them. The 46th Pennsylvania is going to continue through the woods, through the gate area, and it's going to be those men uh, who are going to be firing into James Walker's 13th Virginia on the far side of the field, which is going to force them to evacuate that position and fall back. I'll talk about Branch's Brigade in a moment, as they're the ones who are going to rally and really save this day for the Federals. They're lined up ready to go at a critical point in the action when Stonewall Jackson, who I'll talk about momentarily, uh, is going to rally. But I want to talk about the two Medal of Honors that were won, because this is probably the best spot to talk about them uh, by the Federals during this time. The first one is John Yonker. Yonker is a German who, who uh, immigrated to the States and lived in Ohio, joined the 12th U.S. Infantry. And during the fight, while his, his compatriots are on that skirmish line firing at, at the uh, Confederate artillery, he's going to be, he's, he's going to be used as a courier moving back and forth between the lines, and he will be awarded a Medal of Honor for that action that day. Uh, Yonker survives the war. He's gonna become a prisoner during the wilderness and end up at Andersonville, where he will eventually, uh, after the war, uh, testify at Henry Wirtz's trial. He's gonna receive his award in November, 1893. As a matter of fact, Yonker submitted himself for an award for the award, uh, something you cannot do. And once he was told of that fact, uh, had the right to one of his officers who was still serving in the army out west to initiate the process. The second uh, Medal of Honor uh, winner is George Corliss. He's a lieutenant on this day in the 5th Connecticut. Uh, he is going to be one of seven color bearers uh, for the 5th Connecticut this day and will be take and will go down with two leg wounds. Uh, he is going to submit his submit his application or have it submitted in the early 1890s. Uh, he and his commander, George Chapman, did not get along, and so he waited until Chapman passes before he initiated his claim. Uh, it was eventually awarded to him, and, and like most award, uh, Medal of Honors during that time, uh, you weren't awarded it at the White House, but it was sent to you in the mail. And when Corliss received his, his box in the mail, he opened it up, took a look at it, flipped it over, and they had his name spelled wrong. And so he had to send it back and get it redone for him. So there you go, the US government in action. One other man I wanna talk about during the, the assault is Lieutenant William Warren. You can read the five wounds that he describes that he took as he advanced across that wheat field, uh, including his fourth wound, which a mini ball struck him clean in the neck Separated the carotid art, separated the carotid artery in the wind, in the windpipe, uh, but did not cut either. It's the fifth wound that's finally going to put him down during the day, and he's going to lay out in the field. A Confederate after the fight is going to find him, look, probably looking for for a good set of shoes and anything in the pockets. Realize he's still alive. Take Warren's oil skin and stake it to the ground so the lieutenant has shade. It rained the day after the battle, and so Warren had some water too. He's finally recovered two days after the fight, evacuated to Orange Courthouse, 
where he was probably given some sort of medical treatment at that point, put on a train to Richmond and eventually into prison. He's exchanged in November, 1862 and is mustered out of the service thereafter. But he joins the 28th New York again in late May, 1863, just so he can uh, be mustered out with the entire regiment as they were a two year regiment and mustered out after Chancellorsville and before Gettysburg. His war is not through. In the fall of 1863, he enlists again in a New York regiment and serves out west where he's gonna be wounded two more times. He survives the war and is gonna be and is going to be a victim of cancer in 1904. And I like to tell people when I'm given this presentation that you need to go to work tomorrow if this guy can get up and go to work the following day. Stonewall Jackson was on the far right of the Confederate lines when Crawford's brigades attacked and penetrated around Garnett's flank and into the woods and threatened Tolliver's men. He made the comment basically saying, there's serious work being done over there and race towards the scene of action. He lost his hat along the way and he grabbed the flag. When he got to the point near the Crittenden Gate, he drew his sword and tried to rally the retreating and broken Confederates. Well, he couldn't draw his sword because it had been rusted in the scabbard. And so he had to detach his sword from his belt and raise both the flag in one hand and the, and the scabbard and sword in the other and said, rally Virginians, Jackson is with you. Rally my brave men. Where's Winder's men? Remember Winder. The effect was electric. The men around Jackson began to rally, but it wasn't the men near Jackson who really saved the day. It was Lawrence O'Brien Branch's brigade of North Carolinians who had by this point had lined up uh, in the line of battle and were ready to advance. Jackson seen O'Brien ready to move forward, but not because O'Brien, the politician that he was, was giving his men a pep talk before he moved forward. Jackson detached, uh, Jackson sent one of his staff officers over to O'Brien to encourage him to move forward. What's interesting though is that Jackson did not follow his advice he gave the VMI cadets before they left VMI. Before the, before the war, Jackson would state that war will come and soon. And what it does, my advice to you is to draw the sword and throw away the scabbard, something Jackson could not do when the time was for him to react to his own advice. Shortly after, or about 30 minutes after Crawford stepped forward, the final brigade, federal brigade, finally began to advance. And that was George H. Gordon's brigade. Three regiments, the 27th Indiana, 3rd Wisconsin, and 2nd Massachusetts stepped forward. This is the 3rd Wisconsin 2nd Fourier into the fight. Earlier, they had been forward as skirmishers, and when they saw Crawford move forward, they were asked by Crawford to advance along with them. The 3rd Wisconsin commander, Charles Ruger, sought permission from Gordon. Permission was given, and the six companies of skirmishers moved forward. Uh, to catch up to Crawford's men. It would be at that time that Ronald's Stonewall Brigade would show up. They would be the first brigade to show up on the high ground on the, uh, on, on the third Wisconsin's flank as they move forward. In less than two minutes, the third Wisconsin's gonna suffer 116 casualties. They're gonna break and withdraw back to their start point, form up again with the, third, with the remainder of their, of their regiment. And when the order is given, Gordon is going to advance. By this time, not only has Ronald's brigade shown up on the flank, but Archer's brigade also of Hill's division has advanced to a spot between filling the gap between Branch and, and Ronald. And they're advancing and clearing those woods of Crawford's men. And this is what Gordon's men are gonna go into. And finally, it's gonna to come to the point where as they advance through this field, Dorsey Pinder's Brigade of North Carolinians is going to appear on their flank, perhaps uh, 50 yards away and fire into their flank. Gordon is going to suffer 341 casualties in its brief fight. It's at this point all along the lines that the Confederates have rallied and are beginning to advance. All four federal brigades 
have essentially spent as, as or shot their wads and are beginning to withdraw. The Confederates chase them across the field. It's up to the 10th Maine, who is Banks' strategic reserve, to slow the advance and allow time for the Federals to clear the field. The 10th Maine is going to advance towards the area known as the point where Garnett's men were originally were, now supplemented or supplanted by Branch. 300, 461 officers and, and men of the 10th Maine are going to advance towards this. Their fight is brief and, and deadly. 179 casualties from the main men are holding, holding uh, a portion of this field, giving, giving Gordon Green or Gordon Geary and Prince's men a chance to get off the field. Green has taken over for Christopher Auger because Auger has been wounded. As the 10th men break, Banks calls his last available unit on the field, and that is the 1st Battalion of Pennsylvania Cavalry under, under Major Richard Falls. Falls has with him 164 men, and they literally charge down the Culpeper Courthouse, Orange Courthouse Road, uh, trying to slow the inoxable Confederate advance. They're gonna take, they're gonna take fire from not only the Brigade of Branch, but Early's Brigade, Tolliver's Brigade, Archer and Ronald's Brigade, uh, 164 men, 71 by time it's done, 71 men are gonna answer the roll call from the 21st Pennsylvania by the time the evening is over with. The Federals are withdrawing off the field. Green's Brigade now under James Tate is holding the left flank and it's up to them with his two regiments to stop any advance from Forno and Trimble. And they do an excellent job of delaying those two, re those two, those two brigades as they advance down the field. Part of the problem for Forno and Trimble was the artillery fire of Latimer was falling into, into their position, forcing them, forcing them to delay their assault and giving time for the Confederates to clear the field. Now, James Tate was the commander of the 1st DC Infantry. Not a whole lot's known about this regiment. Matter of fact, probably very few people knew that the 1st District of Columbia had, had an infantry regiment. The more interesting story takes place after the battle. He's gonna resign his commission as commander of the 1st uh, District of Columbia and become the Provost Marshal for the Alexandria District. And on February 27th, 1863, Tate is gonna be convicted of court-martial on two charges of neglect of duty and disobedience of orders by a general court-martial. This all stems from an incident that took place on Valentine's Day, 1863. It seems that Tate allowed, issued a pass to a gentleman by the name of W.A. Stewart uh, to transport four, tr four trunks containing articles of merchandise, not contraband, which had been examined. And this document had been signed by Tate. Unfortunately, someone else stopped and inspected these trunks, and it turned out the articles, not contraband, were 4,000 packs of playing cards. Yes, 4,000 packs. Uh, these cards should have had a tax stamp on them, and they didn't. Tate was convicted. He resigned his commission at that point. Later, Lincoln uh, saw the court martial, saw that he eventually would be acquitted uh, by a higher ruling, and Lincoln as he reviewed the transcripts, decided this man needed to be made an example of and dismissed from service, but Tate had already been, had already left the service. He's gonna live until 1895 in DC and serve in various positions such as the Board of Police Commissioners and the Justice of the Peace. Kind of an interesting role for a guy who transmitted his legally 4,000 packs of playing cards. The fight actually is gonna continue until about 10 o'clock at night. Jackson presses the retreating men of Banks's command. Uh, he has three fresh brigades, Dorsey Penders, who had seen little action, Charles, uh, James, Charles Field and, and James Stafford. Uh, with, with these three brigades, go forward Willie Pegram's uh, Purcell artillery. In the darkness, they engage the retreating Confeder uh, Federals. Unfortunately for Pegram, four federal batteries from Ricketts Division have positioned themselves along a ridgeline and have and, and respond. Ricketts division was located at Colvin's Tavern, about two miles from the battlefield, maybe even a little less. 
And as the battle progressed, they did not engage at all. They did not move down until nearly seven o'clock at night when McDowell and John Pope arrived on the battlefield. Uh, Ricketts was not gonna act on his own. Sometimes displaying initiative is a bad thing. And so he chose to wait until he had positive orders from McDowell as to what to do. And he moved forward onto this ridge line with those four artillery batteries uh, to protect and screen the retreating Confederates. Pegram's guns are gonna lose 11 horses, two caissons and 11 casualties. And this is gonna be the first photo taken of something dead on a battlefield taken by Timothy O'Sullivan on the 11th of August. For the brief fight, three hours generated nearly 3,500 casualties, 2,300 2, Federals. What makes this interesting is that of the 9,000 Federals, 21% became casualties. This is the largest percentage of casualties by soldiers engaged uh, during the entire war on the Eastern Theater. Only, uh, only Stones River and Olusti in Florida had a higher percentage of casualties to those engaged during the entire war. It's also interesting to note that of those 2,300 casualties, uh, over a quarter were missing and captured. And if you look at the 46th Pennsylvania, 5th Connecticut and New York, over half of the captured were from those three regiments. As they advanced through those woods, their formations broke up and they ended up fighting as small groups and individuals. And when uh, O'Brien's, uh, Lawrence O'Brien Branch's brigade of North Carolinians pushed through those woods, they, they gobbled up most of these men. One of the interesting human, one of the, one of the poignant human interest stories concerns Robert Gould Shaw, Bob to his friends. He was not with the 2nd Massachusetts that day as his, his regiment. Uh, he was actually on the staff of the division commander, Alpheus Williams. And so he didn't go in with the fighting. He's gonna go on to the battlefield two days after the fight and recover his five friends. And he describes them in a letter home. He first finds Richard Carey lying on his back, his head resting on a board and his hands crossed over his chest. He had been mortally wounded and according to an injured sergeant who lay nearby, lingered some hours before he died. Shaw observed, he looked calm and peaceful as if merely sleeping, his face beautiful, and I could have stood and looked at him a long while. Shaw then discovered Williams and the other two captains, Edward Abbott and Richard Godwin, clustered together where the regiment made its last stand. All three had been killed instantly, and he did not attempt to describe their appearance except to note all were much disfigured and the heat was very great. Again, for five days before the battle and two after the temperatures in the 90s. The last man, Lieutenant Stephen Perkins, Shaw stated, was some distance to the rear, lying on his back with his face to his front as, as, as if he had turned during the retreat. The second Massachusetts is gonna suffer 173 casualties in its brief 30 minutes fight. Shaw is going to collect a button and a lock of hair from these men, uh, obtain coffins, and all five would eventually be buried back in Massachusetts. Shaw, of course, would go on to lead the 54th uh, Massachusetts and die uh, in South Carolina. This is the first photo of something dead taken on the battlefield and is on the eastern portion of the Cedar Mountain battlefield. O'Sullivan traveling from Culpeper just after the battle during the, on the 11th of August, came across these first. Uh, he will take another photo of some dead horses on this field. The first humans dead of, uh, taken on a battlefield would be at Antietam in just a little over a month. On the 11th of August, a truce was declared and those wounded who were still alive were recovered and the dead were begun to bury. During this time, Two old friends got back together, Jeb Stewart and George Bayard. Uh, they conversed as old friends with no allusions uh, were made to the present, present war, but spoke of their former times. During an interview, one uh, observer recounted, uh, a wounded unit soldier nearby was groaning and asked for water. Here, Jeb, Bayard said, uh, hold my horse a minute, will you, till I fetch this poor fellow some water. Jeb held the bridle 
Bayard went to a stream and brought the wounded man some water. As Bayard mounted his horse, Jeb remarked it was the first time he had played an orderly to a Union general. Stuart would also make a bet this day with Samuel Crawford about how the Northern papers would uh, describe this fight. Stuart said that they would declare it a great Union victory and Crawford disagreed. Uh, a few days after this truce, a parcel was passed through the lines from Crawford to Stuart with the New York Herald's describing the great Union victory at Cedar Mountain in an orange and an ostrich plumed hat uh, for Jeb Stewart. Uh, Jeb Stewart lost a hat a few days later at Verdesville. It's not known if this was this hat himself. Henry Abbott, Ned's brother visited the battlefield in September of 1863. Uh, this is a photo taken a few days after the fight of the Orange Courthouse Road. The graves you see there along there were probably men from the 10th Main or the first Pennsylvania cab. That is Cedar Mountain in the background. Henry Abbott would write home about his brother. When I look at this place, I think he was murdered. How could an officer cross this open field rising towards the rebels with his right completely uncovered, offering the strongest temptation to the rebels to creep across through the bushes and entirely outflank him? Think of that noble life lost by the heartless vanity of a politician who wishes newspapers to say he advanced. Ned Abbott, of course, is talking about Nathaniel Banks, not a friend of the Democrat from Massachusetts. One of the interesting also stories, uh, stories that took place after the war was, I believe, the first reunion of units from the blue and the gray, the 28th New York and the 5th Virginia. 5th Virginia took the 28th New York's flag late in the fight. Uh, before it was captured, a small piece was cut out from the center of the flag. The surviving Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Brown found the flag in the War Department in 1882 and requested it back. It was given to him. Once he returned to New York, he wrote a letter to the 5th, 5th Virginia Infantry Association and invited the Confederates, his former, his former foes, north uh, to, the, to the 28th New York's annual meeting in 1883. 153 accepted that invitation and traveled north. Stop before Niagara Falls, Brown boarded the train, carrying the, carrying the uh, Confederate veterans and dignitaries and guests, returned, the, gave the flag to the 5th Virgin, Virginia, and on the following day, a one-legged Confederate major returned an American flag to a one-armed federal lieutenant colonel. The following year, the 28th will hold its annual reunion in the Shenandoah Valley, and these two units would periodically get together uh, for the remainder of their time. The last time known, a known joint gathering was in 1902 uh, for the dedication of the New York Monument at the Culpeper National Cemetery and the 28th New York Monument at the, at, on the Cedar Mountain battlefield. Can't find any evidence of a blue grave union before this time. It might have happened, but I haven't found it yet. I mentioned the New York Monument. Uh, in 1901, Judge Daniel Grimsley, who was a local historian, probably the first, he was the first historian for most of Culpeper's battlefields, approached the Culpeper Board of Supervisors and asked for $1,500 to monument Cedar Mountain, Brandy Station, Kelly's Ford, and the Morton's Ford battlefield. Uh, Cedar Mountain was the only field that was ever, ever monumented by Grimsley. On August 9th, 1901, they had a huge gathering, had a picnic. Uh, and after the picnic, they rode across the battlefield and he marked with stakes where each unit fought and where specific events occurred. Grimsley collected a $5 sub subscription from everyone there. And by 1902, there was at least 61 markers on the battlefield. 21 of them are known to survive today. In addition to these markers, uh, there are five regimental markers on the battlefield. One, the third Wisconsin, is on preserved ground. The other four are on private property, uh, but accessible to the members of Friends of Cedar Mountain when we give some tours occasionally. So by 1902, or, or I should say by 1920, the Cedar Mountain battlefield was the fifth most monumented battlefield in the country, behind only Gettysburg, Antietam in the east, Chickamauga, and Vicksburg in, in the west. In addition to the monuments on the Cedar Mountain battlefield, 
there are five monuments in the Culpeper National Cemetery that directly relate to Cedar Mountain. Uh, the New York Monument, Pennsylvania Monument, and then three regimental monuments, uh, the 7th Ohio, the 2nd Massachusetts, and the 10th Maine. And it's behind the 7th Ohio Monument that you will find uh, the grave of George Lapham. I believe there's nine or there's 266 unknowns uh, in this in this cemetery from Cedar Mountain victims, federal victims. My book is The Carnage of Fear is Fearful, The Battle of Cedar Mountain, August 9th, 1862. Uh, it can be purchased uh, through Savas Beatty at SavasBeatty.com. Uh, came out in January of this of last year. So I encourage you to, if you're interested in this fight, uh, to purchase that book. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and I'll happily to entertain any questions that you might have.